I've been held by the Savior. I felt fire from above. I've been down to the river. I ain't the same, a prodigal return. shackles and chains but I've been freed and forgiven yes I have I'm not going back I'll never be the same that's why I sing all my hope is in Jesus thank God my yesterday is gone I would encourage everybody to sing this next song with us. You definitely know it by now. We've done it several times, but just sing with us and worship him this morning. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene and wonder how he could love me a sinner condemned unclean singing how marvelous
crowned in glory His face I at last shall see It will be my joy through the ages To sing of His love for me Singing how marvelous Heavenly Father, God, we praise you for being the one that all of our hope rests on. We praise you for loving us even though we don't deserve it. Lord, you died on a cross alone so that we can worship and live through you. I pray for Chris as he brings the message. Hide him behind the cross of Christ and give him the words to speak. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Good morning. What an exciting day we have today. I want to thank my wife for as a, uh, uh, getting ready for this last sermon. She put several hours in preparing uh, this table. And uh, at the end of this sermon, uh, we have a gift for every family uh, as, a, uh, as just this passage and this Matthew and what we're talking about it. Jesus is King and as Matthew portrays it, but we have a gift for every family. If you're listening online, be, feel free to come by and pick it up. Also, if you have uh, friends that are not here, they're listening online, please take one for your friend, and uh, we would appreciate that. But it is an honor to be here of two, a little over two and a half years in this book. As I told you, that was short for some guys. Uh, some people are seven and eight years in this book, but... Um, it's, it's been a complete journey. My dad asked me, uh, am I sad? And I said, yes, I am sad. I'm a little sad. It's a bittersweet for me, and I've enjoyed this journey. But where are we going next? We're going to continue in the Word of God as we're committing ourselves to that. Um, and I'll let you know. I may do some uh, Christmas things coming up, and then we're going to get back into another passage of Scripture. But uh, we do have some notes for you. If you'll just slip up your hand uh, for the last uh, uh, sermon here in the book of Matthew. If you're missing any of those... Uh, just feel free to uh, call me, shoot me a text, call the church, email me, and I'll be more than happy. I, I've kept all those uh, printed out uh, for those who may have missed those. So just let me know what you missed, and you'll have your notebook and a commentary for the book of Matthew for years to come. Uh, you can sell them. I don't care. Make all the profit you want. Just give your tithes to the church. I don't care. But uh, So I appreciate these guys helping me out each week. Before I begin, I'm, I don't usually tell stories or anything like that, but I thought this was appropriate this morning. Something that I'd heard uh, several times in my life, and I thought this fit well. This is a true story, by the way, at the coast of New, New England. Uh, it was a very dangerous sea coast, and there were some men who saw people losing their lives because of the weather and how it would turn. And so they decided to build a life-saving a life uh, saving station. It was very primitive, just a few boards that they found, something where they could come in and they could get dry and maybe they could sit and, and wait for uh, if they knew a boat was coming in and the weather was really bad. They had one boat and a little shack was all they had. But come to find out, these guys became very valuable in this community. In fact, they had saved hundreds of lives in just a very short time. And so the people's lives that they saved, they actually came back and said, because of my gratitude for this life-saving station, I want to donate my time and my energy and my money 
to this life-saving station. And so this little life-saving station, it began to grow. And it grew, and it grew, one boat to two, two to three, three to four, and they're saving lives. Almost, I mean, the death toll just went really, nearly almost to none. And so as the guys were meeting, and they started thinking, you know what, this is a very primitive place, why don't we make it a little more comfortable? And so they went out and bought some nicer furniture and a little uh, uh, nicer flooring. They painted the walls. They decorated the exterior. And a, one night, a, a huge vessel hauling hundreds of people began to sink. And all these boats went out. And they saved just about every one of those people. Well, you can imagine what it would be to have people in the water they're cold, they're wet, they've got them on the beach, there's sand all over them, there's seaweed all over them. And guess what happens? These hundreds of people went into this newly renovated life-saving station and literally destroyed it. And half of the members became so angry, they said, we're going to build an outhouse and a shower outside that before these people come into our Life-saving station, our club, they will need to clean up before coming in here. Well, half the guys that had started this became irate and said, this is the whole reason we have this. We have it to save lives so people can come in and they can get warm and we can help them recover. Well, there was a vote. Half of them voted to remain a life-saving station. The other half voted Let's turn this into a guy's club. And that's what they did. So the two that, I mean, the, the few that, half that went, and started the life-saving station, they went down the coast a little ways, and they got to one boat, and they built this primitive shack, and they went out saving lives as they always had. And as being thankful for lives being saved, the people came back, and their Life-saving station grew from one boat to two, two to three, three to four. And there again, they said, let's make it nice. They added the nice flooring. They added the nice furniture. They painted it and decorated it. And sure enough, it wasn't long that the people had messed it up. The people they were saving, half of them got mad. And there again, there was another vote. Half decided to remain a club, and the other half said, we're going to make it a life-saving station. So they went up the coast again. They built another one. And i got to ask you the question. I thought about that story over and over. Has history continued to repeat itself off this coast? Has it repeated itself in our churches today? Have we acted like these men were... At one time, our goal was to be a life-saving station, but we changed our mind because we wanted the nice furniture, we wanted to be comfortable, we wanted our club. We wanted to remain eternal. We didn't want people of other nationalities and other genders and other races to come into our club. We want to keep it just the way we want to keep it and control it. And I dare say that all over the world that when churches split, it's because they didn't get their way in their club and they have forgotten the purpose of the church. And we're, we talked about last week, what is the central purpose of the church? I didn't ask you what the purpose was, I asked you what the central purpose was. And I said this, that we know the purpose of the church, we find in Acts chapter 2 verse 42, it said we talked about the teaching the fellowship, the breaking of bread, and the prayer. There's no doubt about those things. We also said the Bible speaks that we are to care for others, we are to praise the Lord, and we are to remain pure. But the central purpose of the church was none of those things. We said the central purpose of the church was to glorify God. And I said, if I was to have you to do that and define that, how would you do it? And I'm thankful for the book of Isaiah that he did that. Isaiah 6.3 says... And one called out to another and said, Holy, 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 the Lord of hosts, the whole earth is filled with his glory. Isaiah defines the glory of God by the holiness of God. 
And when you see the holiness of God, then the glory of God is going to be revealed. And I said, if we're wanting to really to go out and make disciples, you have to explain the holiness of God. Because Jesus is not just an anybody else. Jesus is king. And there is none like him. The result of the holiness of God we saw was found in Leviticus 10. And we said this, and I'm almost done with my introduction. And the Lord spoke, saying, By those who come near me, I will show myself holy, and before all the people I will be glorified. And this is what he says. When a person becomes a new creature in Christ, by becoming a believer, then, all God, then God will be glorified amongst all. He says, when you become a new creature and you understand that there is none like God and you want to be a part of that new holiness of God, you want to be a part of that being a new creature of God, you want to be a part of that, now God is going to be glorified. And Jesus is this one who is holy. What makes Jesus Christ king? Because we said that he was sinless. This was all last week's message. Which makes him holy. Holy is, he is separate. There is none like him. We said that he was a perfect sacrifice, which made him holy. What makes Jesus king? He is righteous before the Father, and he was the only one. And one day, as we see the martyred saints, as they will come up and uh, during the tribulation and they will be entered in and we they will begin to say why don't you avenge our deaths and he takes and puts a white robe on them representing you are now robed in his righteousness nothing good that we have done if i was to ask you how are you going to enter into heaven you have no answer other than to point to the son not only this he was the only one that rose again because the sacrifice was accepted by god there's no other person who could have died for you and me other than Jesus Christ. Jesus is holy. And this is the message of the gospel. God's desire from the beginning was this, that he wants a relationship with every single person. I want you to understand this. When Adam and Eve sinned and ate whatever they ate, from the tree it wasn't Adam going to look for God it was God going to look for Adam you know what God was seeking a relationship with Adam do you know when God calls you out he is seeking a relationship with you he is seeking seeking a relationship with the entire world since the fall of man and we understand through reading going through the book of Matthew we've understood this that Christ was going to use Israel to make disciples, but they rejected him. Remember in John 1, 11, he came unto his own, and his own received him not, referring to Israel. And as Israel rejected the idea of being the mouthpiece of Jesus Christ, to go into all the world, to preach to the Gentiles, to, to all the nations, to all the genders, to all the nationalities... Jesus is now no longer assigning just the Jews to be his witness, but Jesus is now making every color, every nation, every gender, every race, every nationality his witness. And God never intended just to save the Jews, but he wanted the whole world to be saved, but he was going to use the Jews to be his mouthpiece. And now we see in Matthew chapter 28 that this is all changing. And in order to be, in order to make disciples for Jesus Christ, Jesus says, you must be willing to do this, to be this. Number one, you have to be a Christian, do you not? You have to be a follower of Jesus Christ to be able to make a disciple of somebody else. That's clear. But once you have, are, are wanting to Say, you know, you're explaining the holiness of God and you're leading people into a relationship with Jesus Christ or who he's called. He says it's very important that you continue this ministry on with him. He says the very first thing that you have to be is present. Present. Willing. 
Now go to Matthew chapter 28, verse 16, and it says, But the eleven disciples proceeded to Galilee. Jesus has now rose from the, the grave, and he is walking amongst the earth for the 40 days. And this is day between 20 and 30. This is what I can tell the best of my knowledge, trying to compare the Gospels. The day between 20 and 30. And the disciples were told to go to Galilee, were they not? The eleven was to proceed to Galilee. This has already been prophesied by Christ. He had already told them to go to Galilee. Matthew 26. He says, after I've raised from the dead, he says, I'm going to go ahead of you to Galilee. Guys, I'm going to be honest with you. If that was the one prophecy right there that he prophesied and it came true, that would be amazing alone. But we know there were thousands. And he says, I'm going to go ahead of you. Matthew 28, 7. And the angel says, go quickly and tell his disciples, talking to Mary, that he had risen from the dead and he is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Behold, I have told you. What is he saying? Disciples, go to Galilee. Matthew 28, 10. Then Jesus said to them, do not be afraid. Go and take the word to my brethren and leave for Galilee and there they will see me. Over and over, this, this prophecy was made If you want to make disciples for Jesus Christ, you're going to have to show yourself willing to go and do what he said to do and be obedient. And I've often thought, what if they didn't go? What if they didn't go? What if they would remain fishing? What if they had said, I'm not going to be at that service. I'm not going to be obedient in that way. I'm not going to say what he wanted me to say. What if they would have just decided not to go to Galilee because they had something else to do? You know what? We hear this all the time. Oh, I wish I'd have been there for that. I wish I could have got there. I wish I would have been obedient to this. What if the disciples would have just said, I'll get there when I get there. What if Mary, Magdalene, what if Mary, what if they would have come and and they would have said, you know what, I just want to sleep in today and I don't want to get up early in the morning and go and and put the, the last of the spices on Jesus Christ. What if they would have said, I'm just tired. They would have missed the angel. They would have missed that the tomb was open. Would that Mary or Magdalene ever taken anything for what they would have saw that day? Don't they wish they would have just slept in? That would have been more important. And here the disciples, they says, I'm going to Galilee because that's where Christ is. And I want to be where Christ is. And I want to be obedient. And the Bible says that they went to this mountain. I'm going to go ahead and tell you we have no idea what this mountain is, where it is. We know it's in Galilee because the Jews had already rejected him and he's now in Galilee because I believe there's going to be more of an opening of people who will receive this message. Now, who is Jesus telling this command to? Well, if he's telling the disciples to go, well, then it must be to the disciples, but it wasn't. Commentaries agree that this was not just to the 11 because Judas had already killed himself. Who was this to? And I believe, I've already talked about this verse earlier. It's found in 1 Corinthians 15, 6. Do you remember where he appeared to 500, more than 500 at one time? Jesus is sitting on this hillside, and people are sitting there, and there's more than 500 people at one time that Jesus is appearing to. And this is where I believe, Matthew 28, 16, he's talking to to this now what is the importance of this I've already showed you that he tried to go into his own to to tell them to be my mouthpiece to make disciples and they didn't receive him so now he's in Galilee and the commission was not just to the disciples because that way it could be portrayed well that's just to pastors that's just the leaders in the church that's just to evangelists you know who he's appearing to? He was appearing to the Mary Magdalene's. He was appearing to the Bob's. He was appearing to the, to the Tyler's. He was appearing to everybody who was willing to follow after him more than 500 at one time. What does this mean for you and I? This command is not for the pastor, 
for the youth pastor, for the Christian school teacher. This is for everybody who claims Jesus Christ as their Savior. This is who this command is to. And he says this, when they saw him, on, when they were on the side of that mountain, I don't know how they got the word. I'm sure word spread quickly. This is where Jesus is going to be. You know what? I got something else to do. I don't think I want to see somebody who's been resurrected. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some of them doubted when they saw him. When they saw Christ's holiness and that it was truly him and there was none like him because here is a man who was resurrected from the grave. I imagine this was an awe. Now I want you to think about this worship service. Some of you have been in worship service where your heart, you just poured out and you were broken. And by the way, many of those don't happen in a building, do they? Many of those happen sometimes in your car when you're riding with the Lord. Sometimes those happen beside your bed. Sometimes that when God breaks you and you become to a point of worship in your life and maybe it's, it's when you're singing or maybe it's when you're praying or you're with the Lord and he absolutely just enters into the room and you are so broken and, you're sa- and you begin to worship. And you don't care who's around or who sees you. And it's not a show. It's not running up and down the aisles trying to bring attention to you. This is just between you and the Lord. And here is Jesus is walking and he's on this mountain. And he sees these people. All of a sudden they prostrate themselves onto the ground. Can you imagine the relief? Can you imagine the hope that these people felt at this time? And they probably had a worship service on this mountain like has never been before or since then. Can you imagine the joy that they were experiencing? That's what worship is, isn't it? It's about a joy. It's about a praise unto the Lord because of the hope that lies within. Can you imagine their Savior was dead and now he's come back? I have hope. Not just, I hope he comes back, I know so hope. There he is. Can you imagine this worship service on the side of this hill that day? But I love the fact that uh, Matthew was transparent. And he said, but some doubted. Some doubted. Don't you think when Thomas was broken, and Jesus came to him, he filled my hands, touched my side. It was the brokenness of Thomas that he was experiencing. These people were so broken, they had followed after him. Some of them, probably for more than three years, they had followed after him, and he was dead. And they were like, I have been through such an emotions over the last three days. Now we add 25 more days, and I'm hearing rumors about him being alive. And I'm just, I don't know if it's really him. He's coming around. Some recognized him because maybe they were spread out. Some had not recognized him at that point. If you want to make disciples, you have to be present. But not only this, you have to have a mouth of praise. If God is not going to be worshipped, then he cannot be truly served. And then, this is what happened. Jesus spoke. Jesus spoke. You know why Jesus spoke? Because he was going to speak anyway. But I began, he began to speak because Jesus knew what they were thinking. He knew who was worshipping, but he also knew who was struggling with their doubts. And some were doubting. And Jesus spoke to them, and those who were doubting knew then it was him. He was revealing to them that he was alive, and the doubt was alleviated at that point with all people. And now I imagine the worship service really broke out. I would imagine some fell on the ground and just were praising God. I I mean, you can't imagine the hope. And then he began to say these next words to the more than 500 that were there that shows us he was not talking to just a few. He was trying to get the message out 
This is for every believer on the face of the earth, what I'm getting ready to tell you right now. And then he begins with an extremely powerful statement that only a holy king can make. He says, all authority has been given to me in heaven and in earth. All. Jesus states from the very start of this great commission that he and only he has the right to be called king. That he, only he, has the right not to be called the high priest, but as Hebrew says, the great high priest. All authority. This means that he has the freedom to act as he so chooses. That, by the way, has been laid out since the foundation of the world. He's telling every one of them, everything that comes in and out of your life has already been providentially decided. I am the one who has authority over that. All I want you to do is to be present, to give praise, to be obedient. All authority has been given to Jesus by God. Now, do you remember in Matthew 21, 23, when the Pharisees walked up to Jesus? He had been... He'd been healing people. People had trusted him, followed him. And the Pharisees walk up anger, angrily and said, Who gave you this authority? Right? Remember that? Who gave you this authority? And Jesus answers the question. But here's the thing. But why didn't he answer the question in front of the Pharisees? Because their ears were already tuned out. We already know long before this, he had already done everything he could to reach him. We saw the last message he preached to them, and they rejected him. We saw all that. He is now going to the believer, and he says, let me answer the question from Matthew 22, 21, 23. God the Father has given me all authority. Now, for you and I, that gets us pretty excited, doesn't it? Because there's nothing that comes in and out of our lives unless he has been given the authority, unless he has been given the permission to do it. Everything that comes in and out, it is, he is allowing to happen. And he says, so don't worry about what's going to happen in the future. You worry about what I'm telling you to do. And he says, you need to be pliant. Now, when he says, let me go back. What authority, I, 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 I just jotted a few verses down here. What authority has been given to him? In this, we see in John 5, 22, he has been given all judgment to be the son. Why is it that Jesus is going to be the one to be able to judge the whole world? Because he is righteous, he is holy, nobody will judge like he will because it will always be correct. And then it says, God has made him both Lord and Messiah. That's the authority he's been given. And then in Philippians 2, 9, God highly exalted and bestowed on him a name, which is above every name, which there again makes him holy. And so that the name of every Jesus, every knee is going to bow, every tongue is going to confess that Jesus Christ is, is Lord to the glory of God of the Father. He has been given a name that there is no other name like. That you're either going to fall down, prostrate, and worship Him with your life right now, or you will do it one day, but it will be too late. Every knee is going to fall. Why? Because all authority has been given to the King. And then He says this. He says, you need to be pliant. You need to be present, but you need to be pliant. Now, do you remember the word pliant or pliable? You know, Jeremiah talks about the, the one that was working with clay. And the clay, talking about making it again. But if, if, you're, if you're a person who works with any type of clay and you're on there, the clay has to be pliable. And it has to be able to be shaped and molded. And you have to be willing to do things. Because simply he's obeyed you to, to, to be in obedience. And he's called you to do it. And this is what he tells every one of us. Go, therefore, 
How many mission conferences have you sat in and you've heard these two words preached on? Go therefore. Now, this is the reason he started with, all power has been given under me. Because all power and authority has been given to the king, he's saying, I've got a command for you. Go, therefore. The therefore is because all power has been given to the king. Now you can go. Now there's two misunderstandings with these words. The King James presents it as, go ye therefore. But not only in that, in the, in the, in the English uh, grammar, the King James turns this verse around. And I'm going to show you what it, what it means in the Greek. It's not, go. I've heard preachers preach, you need to go, you need to go, you need to go. And that's true, but that's not what the Greek is saying here. It's aorist past tense. Jesus saying, having gone, or going, it's past. It's not something that I'm planning on going. He is saying, if you have to already be going or have gone in order to make disciples, because you're not going to make disciples sitting in your house. You're not going to make disciples keeping your mouth closed. You're not going to make disciples doing this. He says, you need to already be going. That's, it's the aorist past tense. I mean, it's nothing futuristic about this word at all. And it's not the imperative of this verse. I've heard entire messages preached on this one word. It's not the emphatic. It's not the imperative. It's not the exclamation point. Go! It's not it at all. It's not the imperative. This is not the point that Jesus was trying to make. So what was he trying to make? I want to show you the imperative. He says, go therefore and make disciples. Making disciples is the command of this verse. It is the, the emphatic, the imperative of this verse. And what does it mean? Understanding, what does it mean to make disciples? If you understand what this means, a disciple is somebody that is filled with the Holy Spirit. Somebody that has a new nature in Christ. That wants to obey and is repentant of their sin. Somebody that has said, you know what, I want to follow after this holy righteous God and I surrender to this king and he says make them a disciple it's simple this is really simple if you're going to make a disciple you cannot talk about I'm getting ready to go that I'm already going and already have gone that's what he's saying and then he says, who do I make disciples of? Of all nations. Jesus is saying once again, the gospel is not just for Sumner Township. It's not just for Greensboro or Guilford County. It's not for North Carolina. And he explains that in another passage of scripture. He says, it is, but it's also for North America, South America, it's, it's, it's Iceland, it's Greenland, it's, it's Africa, it's Russia, it's China, it's Japan. It's all over the world. He says it's for every single person. That is my desire for you and for me is to make disciples. And I want to ask you this. What was the design and the, and, and the reason for a lifeboat station? It was to save lives. What is the design and the reason of the church? Jesus says, to make disciples. Or is it to have great programs? Or is it to have comfortable seating? Or is it to have the temperature just right? Here's one. It is to have your needs met. And I want to leave that church because I, my needs are not being met. Jesus had nothing to say about your needs or my needs being met, he's saying, your life is now a surrender to the king. In fact, if you remember back to Matthew 22, he talks about this very thing in the wedding feast. 
and he invites certain guests, and those guests refuse to come. And then he told his servants, he said, Go therefore to the main highways, and as many as you find there, invite them in. Because the original guest would not come, he said, Ready? On this hill sign, all 500 plus of you, I'm calling you out to go make disciples. To everybody. So how do you make a disciple? And if you make a disciple, I'm going to talk about these next two words, and I think it's important that I put this pause in here, is because the three participles that are describing or modifying the main verb here, the main verb being make disciples, the first participle means going or have gone. The second participle is baptizing. The third participle is teaching. So all these things are important, but they're modifying the main verb. He says, if you want to make a disciple, you're going to have to be going, going, have gone. You have to baptize them, and you have to teach them. This is how you're going to reach all nations. This is our program. This is our purpose. And if we deviate from this purpose, we're nothing but a boys and girls club in nice comfortable seating in air conditioned rooms that looks really really beautiful on the inside and so now we go to the last part of 19 he says having gone having gone they've received the holiness of God the gospel of Jesus Christ what's the next responsibility to make them a disciple is we have to baptize them. Baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Now, I think it's interesting how people really downplay baptism. It's not that important. Baptism is the initial act of obedience after salvation. Water baptism is the immersion going all the way down. That's what the Greek is describing it as. Because the association with baptism we see in Romans chapter 6, 3 and 4. But I just put 4 up here. And it says, therefore we have been buried with him through baptism into death. So that our Christ, Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father. So we might walk in the newness of life. Folks, if you haven't been baptized and you're a follower of Jesus Christ. Then what are you waiting on? Because it's showing the world that you are a follower of Jesus Christ. Now. If you were a Jew, when Jesus is preaching this, that was a big deal. Because it says they were leaving the legalism, leaving the boys club, the Sanhedrin, and they now are a follower after Jesus Christ. They're getting ready to lose their business. They're getting ready to lose their house. They're getting ready to lose their association. They're getting ready to lose, quote-unquote, friends or acquaintances because they were baptized. Now, here in America... We put it in a room, baptize, people clap, we have a meal. But in some places, they're dead. I'll never forget, we have baptized people at Lake Norman. But one of the most impactful baptisms, some of our teenagers had not been baptized, and we went out to Pensacola Beach on one of the camps, and some of them had gotten saved recently, and some of them had not been baptized, and they wanted to be baptized. And so, of course, we can't put the camera, put the parents on, so they could see it from their location. And we walk out into the water, and immediately the crowd around us, they knew what was getting ready to take place. And people stood up. On that beach. And they sort of closed in. And it was silent. And I'll never forget. Baptizing those teenagers. And as they come out of the water. The beach people started clapping their hands. Why? 
because they understood that they were showing their association with Christ and they wanted to be a follower of Jesus Christ and they were doing it in front of the world. When you are baptized, it is revealing this. It's simply an outward expression of your inward decision. When you're standing in that water, it's symbolizing the death, the, the, the Jesus being on the cross. When you're going underneath the water, it's showing the, the burial of Jesus Christ. And when you come out, it's revealing the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And one day, you and I will be resurrected because He is resurrected. And as you walk out of that river, out of that ocean, out of that baptismal pool, you are showing, I'm now walking in a newness of life. Because I have a holy God that now resides inside of me. You see, baptism, for many people, is the point of no return. It doesn't take much discovery on the internet to read different stories from missionaries, from pastors. One particular pastor went into a, to a Muslim community, which he should have never even been allowed and for the first time, Christians were just tired of meeting secretly. They were tired of being so secret. They were, they were tired, and they are saying, we don't care no more. And we are now going to preach and teach the gospel. It was, it was a death sentence. And Pastor H was preaching and teaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. And at the end of that service, 38 converts lined up to be baptized and he baptized them the pastor said he got to know pastor h very well that week thursday pastor h went mission, missing some friends of theirs were trying to locate him they tried to go out and find him and they feared the worst the next, the next Sunday, another pastor stood up in the pulpit to preach the message. And the pastor's wife walked down the aisle with tears in her eyes, holding a cell phone. She said, they just found his body. Some Christians saw some, gov some Muslims pull his body off the back of a truck and dig a shallow grave and throw him in it. They unburied him. They, they pulled him out of that ground, and he had been beaten severely for a couple of days and killed him. Why? Because he was baptizing people. You see, if you're a Muslim, and if a Muslim is seen reading the Bible, they can claim this, that I'm studying it to debate Christianity more clearly. That's why I'm reading the Bible. Okay, okay, I understand. If a Muslim is seen sneaking into a church building, they can excuse that behavior for the very same way that I'm going to try to attack, I'm going to try to descend what they're saying, rescind what they're saying, trying to come against them in some way. If a Muslim is seen talking to a Christian pastor, they can simply say they're observing, they're witnessing, they're lifting up their attributes of Muhammad to them. But here's the difference. The one thing a Muslim can never explain away is baptism. Baptism is the point of no return. It is showing the separation of Muhammad to Christ. It is leaving that, that, that Muslim community and it is going to a Christian community that they have joined another community. They are now converts of Jesus Christ. And at baptism, persecution soars because it identifies with Jesus. And it's real. And it's forever. When these people are being baptized, they're not coming out going to a dinner. They are looking over their shoulder because now it's very possible that they are going to be killed. And I dare say... If we lived in that environment, would we take baptism for granted? Do you think if you were a Jew or a Gentile, when Jesus was talking, do you think you would have taken 
baptism for granted? If you have a flourishing business and you claim to be a follower of Jesus Christ and you were trying to keep that secret because it will affect all of your income coming in, it will affect your family. And Jesus brings you to the point of if you're going to follow after me, you have to be baptized. And they know they're getting ready to lose their business. They're getting ready to lose. And he says, this is the importance. Ready? But all authority has been given to me in heaven and in earth. What I'm asking for you to be is pliable. And then he tells us this last thing teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. The church's responsibility is to teach. But you cannot continue to teach somebody in the commandments and oracles of God until they've received the gospel of Jesus Christ and placed their faith in Jesus Christ. So Jesus says it's not about winning them baptizing them and walking away from them now you have a personal responsibility did he say pastors you have a personal responsibility yes but do you have the personal responsibility for everybody no he's saying you 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 have a personal responsibility to teach the people that you're making disciples you said but i don't have the gift of teaching so that leaves me out he's saying you can open up the scriptures and saying, this is what the Word of God teaches us. Maybe it's 1 Corinthians where Paul says, oh, well, you can't do that because you're still in the milk of the Word. And people are still having to teach you when you should be teaching. And he says, what am I to teach them? Everything that I have commanded you to live and follow the Lord in the obedient life. Why is this so important? Because whoever the writer of Hebrews was, we don't know. don't matter. Hebrews 5, 9 says, And having been made perfect, he became to all those who obey him the source of eternal life. He's saying the, 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 the works that faith is going to put out is obedient life. And he says, And what you're doing and teaching these new converts is how to live an obedient life. What does Christ say how they should live their life? And then he finishes up with this. And lo, and here's the power. I am with you always, even to the end of the earth, end of the age. He says the word, and lo. This is sort of like this. Look up here, class. You imagine 500 plus people as they're watching him, that he says, look, look. And lo, he says, I want your attention. This is important. He says, I am. Here's the imperative of this verse. I am. And he's saying, my very presence will be with you. When you go out into the, the, the highways and the byways, he is saying, you will never be alone. I am walking with you. I am inside of you through the power of the Holy Spirit. I am the one directing your paths. And how long will I do this? Always. Till you take your very last breath. You know what he's saying? You're not going by your own power. You're not going by your own strength. You're doing it in my strength, in my power. One commentary I think explains this perfectly. Why is it that we need the presence of the Holy Spirit directing our path? Because Jesus loves people more than you do and Jesus loves people more than I do we need his power he cares more than you and I do he's the only one that can penetrate the hearts unlike you and I can can but not only this as the guys get up and preach the word 
He even cares more about the integrity of the word more than we do. That's why it has to be done through him and living this Christian life through him. What makes Jesus king? Jesus is king over heaven. Jesus is king over all the universe. And Jesus is king over every circumstance that comes in and out of our lives. He has been given that authority that nothing enters in or exits out unless he has allowed it. This is the king that you are surrendering your life to. Some of you, I'm asking this question, is he really your king? And some of you can sit in here today and say, he's not. Some of you can sit in here and say, he absolutely is. I'm asking you this, what are you waiting for? What are you waiting for? What are you waiting to make disciples? What are you waiting to go out for? What are you waiting for? What are you saving your money for? Well, I have to have that big bank account. What are you saving it for? What are you saving your physical life for? Here's the importance. There was a missionary that went to a primitive pagan society. And as they were ministering to this pagan society, there was one woman that this female missionary was so drawn to. You know how you just get a burden for somebody? I mean, just that person has been led on your heart. That's the one God's calling. He's, 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 he's bringing to the point of repentance, and you just know. So she pours into this lady's life, and this lady is gloriously saved. And as the, soon as the woman was saved, she looks up with tears in her eyes to the female missionary and said, I wish you would have come sooner. You know, of course, the missionary was like, well, me too. But the missionary really couldn't figure out what was the urgency. I mean, she's saved, right? She's ready to come to know. I mean, she came to know Christ. Now we're going to continue with the discipling. She said, no, no, no. The missionary said, well, why, what is, what is, why did I need to come sooner? Everything's okay. She said, you see, I was a mother. I had a son. And just a few weeks before you came, I offered my son on an altered sacrifice. And I burned him up for the gods of this tribe. C.T. Studd said this. There's only one life, and it will soon pass. But only what's done for Christ will ever last. How happy will Christ be when he comes back or we die and he finds huge savings in our church saving account? Or he finds that our lives are so healthy that we have maintained a perfect health record because we've made sure that we didn't destroy our health by going out to all the world. What are you saving yourself for? Because I would say this. People in the church, I think they're living their best life now. Now, God, as we have an invitation, as this final five verses, Lord, Matthew has been so clear that you are the one that we should be devoting our life to. You made it so real as we watched your life that you are truly the Messiah. And you come to the end and we, we're at the beginning of the end, so to speak. This is now the beginning for our life. And here is our command. 
What are we waiting for? What are you saving it for? What big experience on this earth are you waiting for? Bigger barns? More stuff? Greater accomplishments on the wall? Lord, I pray this church is not a club, but rather a life-saving station. With heads bowed and eyes closed, it's, I like for Pat to play. I think it'd be appropriate to finish this last sermon. You can stay at your seat, or you can come to the altar. And I want to ask you is, what are you saving it for? What are you waiting on? Who is it that you're trying to reach for the gospel? We'll never be a Billy Graham. But these people need a discipling. Who are you rejecting in your neighborhood, in this community? I don't want that nationality. I don't want that race. Not that gender. I have shown you that this is not to pastors or leaders. This is to everybody who claims Jesus Christ is king. Some of you says, I've never made that decision. He's not my king. But I want him to be. I want to ask you to come down. We're going to show you in his word how you can be a follower of him. And then we're going to disciple you. Because that's our responsibility. It's our command. And then your command, as you grow, is to reach others and make them disciples. The altar's open at your chair. I'm going to ask you this, saying, God, have I been waiting on something? Have I been saving my funds for something? What am I waiting on? The altar's open for you.